and a pleasure to welcome you to the museum's night studio for our Working City Summit. I'm Margaret Lowe Smith. I'm president of Atlantic Live. Um, I like to talk about the Atlantic's history when I start because we've been committed to addressing pressing issues for a long, long time. In the last year, the Atlantic's writer, ta Coates, made the case for reparations. Graham Wood uh, talked about what ISIS really wants. Senior editor Derek Thompson wrote a piece for us called The Miracle of Minneapolis. It's a dream city, according to some people. And one of my favorite quotes from that story is, a, is it, it says, it's really hard to get people to move to Minneapolis. It's almost impossible to get them to leave. So we're here today to talk about making more communities that, that desirable. And we'll meet experts who eat, sleep, and breathe urban renewal, and how to transform city life for everybody. We'll hear about efforts to solve complex social problems in education, housing, healthcare, and workforce development. And we'll be talking about holistic solutions. We're streaming the event at atlantic.com slash live. You can join the Twitter conversation at Atlantic underscore live. And we're using the hashtag working city. Um, we will have time for your questions, for a few questions after each conversation. Um, and just remember to silence your cell phones. So before we get going with the conversations, I want to thank our underwriters who are making this convening possible, the Low Income Ho Investment Fund and the City Foundation. And I am delighted that City Foundation President Brandy McHale is here with us today. Brandy, the mic is yours. So I know that it's customary to start a gathering like this and to say something like, I'm so pleased to be here with all of you. And while I know we have a set of dynamic conversations planned, I'm actually not that pleased that we're here. My overarching feeling today is one of deep concern. I've been struck like the rest of the nation by the events just a few miles away from here in Baltimore but even before those media headlines, I've been really struck by the growing national conversation that's taking place about the realities of inequality in America. So I stand here today with a sense of urgency. I'm actually frustrated. I'm angry and I'm worried. Why? My organization, like many of you in this room, We've worked together tirelessly to find solutions that will help move the needle on long-term poverty and help connect the most economically vulnerable populations in our cities with an on-ramp towards economic success. And this isn't to say we haven't been working hard. We've been working incredibly hard. That's why I'm so frustrated. And we, each of us, has me have many incredible micro stories of success. But the challenges are growing faster at the macro level, and the urgency is growing. The number of Americans living in cities has doubled. We're no longer talking the way we were a decade ago about disinvestment in cities. That situation has shifted, and while cities are seen now and can be places of innovation and prosperity, that doesn't always translate into economic opportunities for all residents of those places. One in five. Think about this, 20% of most urban populations are living in poverty. And just last week, new research came out showing that if you grow up in a high poverty neighborhood, that is an important indicator of the probability of forestalled social mobility. Let me make it very clear for all of us. If you're born poor, if something unexpected happens to you and you find yourself poor, it's really hard to escape it. People speak openly now about um, the two Americas. Newspaper headlines call out on one page that economic data is improving. But in the very next column, or the very next page, we talk about how Americans at all income levels, and all, this is not just low-income people, feel less economically secure than ever before. The evidence of a growing divide isn't a risk or a threat. It's the reality that we're living within. Sometimes hear people talk about this reality as a tale of two cities. When we do this, it concerns me because we depersonalize this as an issue that doesn't affect me. That it's a challenge for those people living over there, those people in that part of the city. But this just isn't true anymore. 
let's just for a moment put aside the social implications of this and just look at this purely from an economic standpoint. The cost of doing nothing amounts to a whole lot of something for all of us. $93 billion a year and $1.6 trillion over a lifetime in public, additional public expenditures. This accounts for higher costs for services, less tax revenue, and entire generation wondering if the American dream is for them. This is what frustrates me and really worries me. This is not the type of community that I want my own children growing up in, let alone all of our children growing up in. And despite a great deal of progress in the past 50 years, our approach to community development has remained basically unchanged. We have many players, starting with philanthropic foundations, local governments, community-based organizations, and we've been working in silos, focus on our individual solutions to poverty. We have great organizations and initiatives focused on housing, some focused on early childhood education, workforce development, public health. And we've made a real difference in the lives of real people. I don't want to discount what we've done, but it's been in a siloed approach. And the oppor opportunities for collaboration have been few, and the chances of partnering to achieve a common goal even fewer. Now, when I say partnering towards a common goal, this isn't just about coordinating to deliver a comprehensive set of services to a specific set of people in a specific location. We actually know how to do that and have gotten pretty good at that. This is about engaging a wide range of stakeholders to create the cities of opportunity that we want them to be, that we need them to be. Those of you that are working on the front lines of this issue day in and day out, you know this isn't easy to do. It's awfully easy for me to stand up here as a funder and talk about it, but I will say the reality, if it's hard to do, it's even harder to get funded to do. Two years ago, um, we're having a conversation with our partners at the Low Income Investment Fund, and we just came up and said, well, let's try it. Let's try to make it easy for organizations to do something about this. And we funded what really is a modest demonstration program called Partners in Progress to test this idea of a community quarterback. This is an entity that will stand up and say, let's come up with a game plan together so we don't chalk up individual victories, but let's go all the way and win the championship. I'm sorry to mix my metaphors. I do it all the time, but here I go. The other way to think about it is let's not treat the symptoms of poverty. Let's work together to fight the disease. A year in, our quarterbacks have engaged over 400 partners, and they've in turn reached more than a million people as part of um, local collective impact strategies. And so whether your goals are to double high school graduation rates, develop affordable housing, or make sure that every kid just arrives to school having eaten breakfast and ready to learn, having a local partner act as his community quarterback can help us all accelerate these individual goals. Now, I know, we know, everybody I know, all of you sitting here know deep down, 14 organizations in 10 cities just isn't enough to fully move the needle in these specific places, let alone all the other communities across our country that may not have the same access to the financial, social, and political capital it takes to pull this off. And so I want to encourage all of us to think about today's event about how we can bring together our different backgrounds, experiences, and knowledge, and create lasting solutions to complex social problems. I challenge all of us to think about the events over the past few weeks and about the ongoing needs in your own communities and not identify what we can do together, but to actually stop and say, how do we fundamentally work different? How do we work smarter? And how do we channel our frustration into collective action and collective impact in our cities. The kind of action and impact that promotes social and economic opportunities in our communities for everyone. I look forward to listening today, to talking with you today and learning, and thank you all for being here.